All right, Deputy Avila, I'll let jurors present, madam. Yes, Judge. All right. Before I call for our jurors, any issues I need to take up? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, yesterday evening, the state received a email from John Melnick with Mr. Steele and Mr. Sharp copied on that email. Mr. Melnick advised that he represents our next witness in this case. Prior to receiving that email, um, the state had spoken with our witness on multiple occasions in preparation for trial. Um, after yesterday at about five or 6 p.m., whatever time I received the email, he advised that we need to cease all communications with his client. However, yeah, his client is? Mr. Kenneth Copeland. Okay. However, um, his client is not, there's no open pending litigation. We were operating as a witness. Um, and so Mr. Melnick advised, I don't know if he wants to be present or not, but that he was, he had court at 9 a.m. before Judge Krause. Um, and so I'm bringing that to the court's attention. Um, the state did offer Mr. Copeland use immunity in this case, so that anything that he testifies to um, in this particular proceeding would not ever be used against him. Um, your, your Honor has signed that order, and so we are ready to move forward. However, I did want to bring to the court's attention that Mr. Melnick did advise that he was his attorney and that he um, was present in the building, I believe, wanted to either address the court, but... Um, okay, well, if he's inserting himself in that particular respect, he needs to probably be here. So can we send somebody up to Judge Krause's to to uh, inquire? Because, or is he here? Or is he I, outside? I, I have not seen him yet. So is I'm, Mr. Copeland or um, his counsel present? Mr. Copeland is um, present in the okay. courthouse, yes. All right, where's Mr... Um, where's Mr... Judge, I saw Mr. this morning. I think he's in Judge Carnes. Oh, Mr. Carnes. Okay, could you, uh, can we see if we could find him, please, and have him tell him that we're about to call his, call his client? I'm not sure if any of Mr. Sharp, Mr. Steele has, I do not have his phone number. Okay. Well. And while we're waiting for that, I do have two other issues. Hold on, let me. Debbie Avila, can you ask one of your colleagues, or, or Debbie Ham, can you, uh, See if you can go up or have one of your colleagues go up to uh, Judge Carn Sales and uh, see if we can, uh, one, either get him down here or two, uh, ask Judge Carn Sales when he would be available. And tell him that we also have a witness that we need to call. Okay? All right, sir. Um, and then next, Your Honor, while we're waiting in that pendency, uh, Mr. Copeland does have prior criminal convictions. Um, the state did not see in any. We department. might want to take those up if he's got counsel. Okay. Okay. Well, so, I'll wait yeah. So I'll wait. Let's now. wait till his his lawyer is actually here, so um, we can take up those issues um, if he does have counsel. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Melnick is with us now, yes. and that Mr. Copeland is outside. Correct. He's in. No, he's in. Okay. Here. Say again. He's here. Okay. Yes. All right. All right, Mr. Melnick. Good morning, sir. Welcome. Good morning, Your Honor. All right. Um, sir, do you have any issues of concern or that I need to take up before uh, the state calls your client? I do, Your Honor. Okay, go ahead. May I approach? You may. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, sir. So for the limited purpose of this issue regarding whether Mr. Copeland will testify at this trial, uh, I am representing Mr. Copeland. Um, Your Honor, uh, I spoke with several individuals in the Fulton County District Attorney's Office before this case was indicted. Um, and the Fulton DA's office was very well aware that I was representing Mr. Copeland. Um, apparently, they have had conversations with Mr. Copeland outside of my knowledge and presence. Um, now, I can't do anything about that uh, because he talked to them without contacting me first. However. He did contact me yesterday um, and told me that um, he was being subpoenaed to testify here today. And I asked him what he wanted to do. His position had been and has always been that he wishes to exercise his Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. Uh, I have explained to him and I learned this morning that apparently um, an immunity order has been entered under um, OCGA 24-5507 uh, 
um, granting him use immunity for testimony uh, at this trial. I would, I would object to uh, that proposition. And the reason is this. I know very well that the district attorney's office knew about my involvement in this case from the inception of this case. I spoke with Don Geary in 2021 uh, about this matter. Um, and he asked me whether or not Mr. Copeland intended to cooperate with the state. And what he told me is that Mr. Copeland would probably either be um, a witness or potentially a defendant in this case. I spoke with Mr. Copeland. We had numerous conversations uh, between myself, um, Don Geary, and um, Thomas Greiner, who's in the Fulton County District Attorney's Office, who was prosecuting Mr. Copeland for a separate matter. Um, and Mr. Copeland has steadfastly said that he intends to um, exercise his Fifth Amendment privilege. I have also participated in a conference call uh, <coughs> regarding um, a bond for Mr. Copeland when he was um, uh, when he had an indictment in Judge Whitaker's division. Um, present in that conference call was myself, um, Adrian Love. Uh, Adam Abadi, Abby Potter, and Judge Whitaker. And we very specifically discussed the state's concerns about Mr. Copeland getting a bond in that case, um, given that the state wanted to utilize him as a witness in this YSL case. So, Your Honor, Mr. Copeland is here. I can state as his attorney that he intends to exercise his Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. He does not wish to testify in this trial. And I would ask, there is no other, he's not on bond, he's not on probation, there's nothing like that. I would ask that he be allowed to leave this courtroom um, without being compelled to testify. All right. Ms. Um, Hilton, do you wish to respond? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Malik, you are correct. I did go ahead and sign this morning. I'll make a part of the record, um, the court's uh, order. Uh, giving him uh, use immunity. Okay. Good afternoon. Good morning, again, Your Honor. So first, let's give a timeline of events. Uh, Mr. Melnick spoke of speaking with uh, Mr. Don Geary. I would believe. Oh, what does that have to do? Uh, let's cut to the chase. Okay? So I mean, all of that is all of that. It may be so maybe historically. Um, because I want to make sure the record is clear as to what Mr. Melnick said as far as his representation of him, especially as it relates to him being a witness in this case. Okay, all right. So, so I'll let you fill in the, fill in the background. Sure. Okay, go ahead. So when Mr. Melnick, I believe, engaged with Mr. Geary, Mr. Copeland had at that time one, either two or two open pending cases, because uh, this would have been in 2020. 20 or 2021. At that point in time, he had open pending charges with the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. Since that time, those cases have been closed and therefore Mr. Copeland does not have any open pending charges. Therefore, we have not spoken to Mr. Copeland previously when he had open pending cases. We have only spoke to Mr. Copeland as it relates to his, his being a witness in this trial. Mr. Copeland was subpoenaed um, a few months ago, but as we were getting closer to his testimony, we resubpoenaed him again last Friday, um, which was a week from today. When we met with him, we spoke with him briefly. I believe I asked him if he had an attorney or if Mr. Melnick was his attorney. I believe my understanding from Mr. Copeland was that he hadn't spoke to him or that he wasn't his attorney. At that point, we continued to engage in conversation. Mr. Copeland engaged with us. Um, on Monday, we reached out to Mr. Copeland to see if he wanted to come down to do witness prep. We did not meet on Monday. On Tuesday, we thought that he was going to get called. He came down here. We spoke. Um, he, he asked us questions. We answered his questions, and we've moved forward. Um, at no time during any of those conversations that we had with Mr. Copeland that he advised that he wanted his attorney there. We would have obliged that, but I believe that we were having good conversation as he's a witness in our case. Um, last yesterday at our final prep session, um, we spoke with him as about one o'clock in the afternoon in the courthouse. When, when we left the room, 
that we were meeting in. Um, I saw Mr. Max Shard in the hallway. As we left, we had our greetings. And then it was not until 6 o'clock last night that I received an email from Mr. Melnick, copied Mr. Shard and Mr. Steele on that email, and advised that his client was going to plead the fifth. Um, in the state's conversations with Mr. Copeland, he, he had some concerns, and we had told him just in general conversation that we would give him use immunity um, to testify in, in this trial, in the trial. Once we received the email from Mr. Um, Melnick last night, we moved forward, Your Honor, drafting a motion in order to give Mr. Copeland use immunity in this case. 24-5-507, um, Your Honor, lays out that it is the state's um, purview in order to give use immunity because it's only the state that brings charges in this case. And we have decided that whatever Mr. Copeland says, he will have immunity in this trial and in this proceeding. And that has been the state's decision and the state can make that decision. And we have so done that pursuant to 24-5-507. And furthermore, Your Honor, if Mr. Copeland does not testify, um, he could be held in contempt. We had that conversation with him as well, that he could be held in contempt if he does not testify, Your Honor. And so the state would ask that um, the order that the court has signed um, be honored and that Mr. Copeland um, be compelled to testify and not insert his Fifth Amendment privilege and testify as a witness in this proceeding. Yes, you can, Mr. Thank you. So, Mr. Malley, here's the thing. Uh, your client can certainly have advanced his Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. I have signed the order under 24-5-507. So, I, I guess you have you explained to your client the potential second and third order effects that that could occur. Um, depending upon his decision. I have, Judge. Okay. All right. Um, I guess the only thing to do at this point in time is to bring him in and determine whether or not he'd like to, he would like to, um, to make sure he understands I understand. where he is under 24-5-507. He is present in the courtroom, Judge. Okay. Um, what he has told me is that he repeatedly told the DA's office that he did not wish to cooperate, did not wish to testify, and wished to exercise his Fifth Amendment privilege. But I can bring him up and have him state that on the record. Yes. Okay. Come on up, Mr. Copeland. Mr. Copeland, come on up and have a seat here, sir. No, he doesn't need to be sworn in yet. No. All right, Mr. Copeland, um, your counsel, Mr. Melnick, have you had an opportunity to talk with him about um, testifying today? Yes. All right. Has the state provided you a letter of immunity or a copy of the order that I have signed directing that um, they give you use immunity? Yes. Do you have a copy of it? Yes. All right. Can we see that, please? Can I? Yes. I need two copies of it. Actually, three. Um, you're signed. Not yet, sir. Doesn't apply to you yet, Mr. Steele. But it is going to be part of the record, Mr. Steele. I, I haven't filed it yet under Odyssey. I don't think it's made the Odyssey system quite yet. So, anyways. Huh? We have a proposed order. Um, yeah. But I signed, uh, I signed the order this morning, though. I meant um, the manner in which it will be filed. It will not be made public. Okay. All right. Which which copy has been given to Mr. Copeland? The order? All right. All right. Do we have extra copies of that? All right. Mr. Copeland, I want you to, I'm going to mark this as the next court's exhibit in order, okay? Um, Mr. Copeland, can you uh, take a look at that order for me, please, sir? All right, let's just go through it right quick, okay? I just want to make sure that you understand where you are and you have your attorney here. And if you have questions of the court or your counsel, you can go ahead and do that, okay? All right? 
You have to answer yes or no, sir. All right. Okay, all right. I'm not trying to trick you. I'm not trying to do anything other than explain this to you, all right? Okay. Okay, all right. Mr. Copeland, the, this order reads basically, the state of Georgia has moved the court pursuant to this particular statute, which is 24-5-507, to compel your testimony. And our district attorney, Ms. Willis, having determined that your testimony is materially, is necessary to the public interest. And that is, and if you take a look at the footnote, sir, I'm sure your attorney's probably explained this to you, that she has the purview of determining whether or not your testimony is needed for a particular trial. I don't even have that authority. Your attorney doesn't have that authority. You can't decide that, that, um, that maybe, that maybe it's not really necessary. She makes that decision. So, and it's in the public interest. So you've been, you've been subpoenaed in this case to appear before and give testimony in this particular matter. Uh, and, uh, state has provided the court sufficient reasons as to why you are necessary as a witness um, in this case. It appears that you've been properly subpoenaed to appear um, as a witness in this case and that your testimony is um, necessary in the public interest. So that's how we, as a due process, gets you to come to court. I mean, you were noticed as a witness. They've identified you as a witness. They've determined that your testimony is needed. Um, because of the fact that you have some concerns about what you what your testimony may indicate or could indicate in this case, and that's something that you and your counsel have talked about, and I'm not certainly going to inquire about that, but in order to potentially deal with anything that may come out of that. The state is basically knowing that you have a Fifth Amendment privilege, says, okay, we acknowledge that. We're going to give you immunity. And as a result of that, then you have to testify as a result of that. If you don't testify, then I, as the judge in this case, have several remedies. Um, one of those is that I could hold you in contempt and jail you because you have, because the way that you get out of that contempt is to just testify. That's the only thing they wanted in this case for you to testify. So your attorney's told me you're going to invoke your fifth amendment privilege. Done, said. However, the immunity has been signed. I have a copy of that right now. So you're required to testify. So if you don't testify, the state's probably going to ask me to jail you. And I'm probably going to do that. So I'd like you to go ahead out and talk with your lawyer and tell me what you want to do at that point in time, okay? Do you need any more time to talk, Mr. Copeland? Okay. What is your desire at this time? I'm taking the fifth. Okay, you're taking the fifth, but you've got immunity, but you still want to, are you going to testify? That's the thing. That's the question. That's the question on the floor. I've acknowledged the fact you have a Fifth Amendment privilege. But the state's given you immunity, so that overrides that Fifth Amendment privilege. They require you to testify. Yeah, but the state don't know what they're talking about. So they ask me a question that they implicate me, then... Okay, they can't prosecute you on that. They can't. The order pro prohibits them from, from, from allowing them to use that testimony against you. That's what your lawyer, and, and I'm not going to get into any of the machinations or intricacies of what, what may or may not have happened in this case, but Mr. Melnick um, is, a, is a very seasoned criminal defense attorney. I've seen him over the past two decades. I'm sure that he's probably given you very, very good advice, but the state can't use that testimony. They can't kind of say, have it both ways, like you testify and then use that against you to indict you and prosecute you then we wouldn't have any faith that that we need to have people come in and give give testimony. So that's why they can't do that. They kind of can't go back on what they're going to tell you, what they're going to tell you. So I signed the order. They, now, they've asked for immunity. I've signed the order. So basically, whatever you have to tell us, you'll tell us. Say no more. Do you wish to testify, Mr. Copeland? Is that no? You have to say no on the record. Say it again. If, do you wish to testify? He said, I can tell him whatever I got to tell him. That's so right. I testify. You will testify. Yeah. All right, sir. 
Okay. What we're going to do in just a second is I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm going to call for our jurors. I uh, will formally administer the oath to you, and then the state will ask you some questions, okay? And then you'll be cross-examined at some point in time by potentially some... my turn before? Because I think I just said the wrong thing. Sure. I'll tell you what. Why don't you step outside and, let, and uh, talk to Mr. Melnick? All right, can we summon Mr. Melnick and Mr. Copeland, please? Come on up, Mr. Copeland. All right, sir, um, what's your pleasure? Say what? I said, what's your pleasure, sir? Um, do you wish to give testimony? I know you don't want to give testimony in this case, but you've been given immunity in this particular circumstance, um, use immunity. So um, are you going to testify? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right, sir. Then what we'll do at this point in time is um, we'll call for our jurors and we'll swear you in and uh, we'll go ahead and... Uh, Go ahead and, and uh, take your testimony, okay? All right. All right. What is it, Mr. Steele? Does our witness need to be uh, excused? Yeah, sir. Go ahead and stand outside, please. If you wouldn't mind, we'll call you in just a minute. All right. Mr. Copeland has left us. Yes, sir. What's your pleasure? Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning to everyone. Your Honor, I would like um, the court to um, weigh in on this, please. I would like it now. That's why I raised it. But if you do it on a break, that's fine. I mean, whatever you want. But I'm citing to court um, two cases, if you don't mind. Franklin, which is F-R-A-N-K-L-I-N, like Donald Franklin Samuel versus state. It's 166 Georgia Appeal 375. Yes, of course. 166 Georgia Appeal 375. It's in Division 2, 1983. Also Waldrop, which is W-A-L-D-R-I-P versus Head, like Bubba Head, and that's 279 Georgia. 826, that's Division 2. It's, it's uh, Roman numeral 2A, capital A. 620 Southeast 2D2, oh, that's wrong, 829-2005. And, Your Honor, what I'd like you to do is the state has stated today, and Ms. Hilton told me this uh, last evening, I don't remember the time, but maybe 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, something like that. Uh, we had two telephone conversations. Um, she said that she's met with Mr. Copeland and other members of the prosecution team. I asked for any um, notes that were entitled to exculpatory information under Brady. Um, Ms. Hilton call, uh, told me that there was one statement and she emailed that to me and to everyone on the defense side. But Your Honor, um, I don't have any of the other notes. Mr. Copeland met with law enforcement on the January 11th of 2015. So God forbid the killing of Mr. Thomas is at 722 approximately. January 10, 2015, by the early morning hours, I'm going to tell you about four in the morning, Mr. Copeland is on video, audio recording with Detective Thorpe the next morning. So it's January 11th, 2015, and he made statements that he knows nothing about anything. Since then, he has made additional at least five recorded statements that I'm aware of, and he's made other statements that I have nothing on. Anything, that, and he's been inconsistent. So anything that he told the state in this preparation um, would be inconsistent statements, which is impeachment evidence under Brady. 
and the state, I presume, will claim work product. That's why Ms. Hilton didn't give us any of the notes. But work product of the state is not subject, is typically not subject to compelled discovery, except to the extent that such notes may be exculpatory and, and must be disclosed under Brady versus Maryland, which is 373 U.S. 83. Well, that's under Franklin. And then Waldrop versus Head says that work product doctrine gives way to the accused constitutional right to exculpatory and impeaching evidence under Brady. So what I'm asking this honorable court to do is do order the state to produce all notes they had investigated. If they don't want to do that, I ask the court to do um, get a copy of the notes in camera inspection and then meet with us ex parte so we can tell the court what we believe would be inconsistent statements, which is impeachment. That's why I brought it up to the court. All right. Your Honor, as I discussed with Mr. Steele last night, I turned over the statement that I believe was Brady, which was what Mr. Copeland told me about um, an incident in which <clears throat> there was a theft. And I provided that information to um, defense counsel. Outside of that, the state doesn't have any notes. Um, and so there's nothing else to turn over except for what I did turn over. Um, we do have one additional matter, Your Honor, which would be criminal convictions that I would like to address. Okay, let's, deal, let, let, let's, let's deal with the issue of first, the first issue of the notes, okay? Um, do you have any written notes from your interviews of Mr. Copeland? What Mr. Steele is basically saying is that Mr. Copeland's given some a few, he said five, statements, and that some of those may be inconsistent, which would fall into the category of Brady, or may fall in the category of Brady. So do you have any written notes that you or your team took that arguably would be work product, but that I would need to review to determine whether or not they are on Brady? We do not have any written notes on. All right, Mr. Steele, then that satisfies that issue in terms of terms of that. If I find out that there's any other additional notes, then I'll, I'll change my, change the, change the terms of, um, my consideration on that issue. Your Honor, and I'll get you the case in a moment, because I don't have it um, at my mind, unless someone else does, but oral statements must be reduced to writing if they're braided by the process. Yeah. yeah. But they're telling, I think they're saying to you that the only statement that they have that's Brady is, is the one statement they turned over already. And, Your Honor, furthermore, in addition to that, in our conversations with Mr. Copeland, he didn't give us any different information than what is contained in the six interviews that defense counsel has had since 2022. So there's... Outside of this one sentence or this one um, piece of information which we gave, they had, our conversations were not. <laughs> there's nothing. Are you telling me that there's nothing that would not, would not, that needs to be reduced to Brady? Uh, Correct. Produces if, Brady. If there was, we would have reduced it and sent it over. All right. Okay. All right. Let's talk about um, prior convictions. Where's Mr. Melnick? Uh -huh. Can you have him come back, please? All right, Mr. Melnick, um, I wanted you, you to be here for the uh, this, con this part of the conversation in regards to your client because these are prior convictions, okay? All right. Um, your Honor, Mr. Copeland has a total of... Eleven convictions, Your Honor, prior convictions. However, based on 24-6-609, we believe that only four of them will be um, able to be um, <clears throat> discussed during the pendency of this case. Um, the state has not received, and if any defense counsel can correct me, any notice that they wanted to use any convictions greater than 10 years old. And so I wanted to put on the record the convictions that are greater than 10 years old. Um, again, I did not see a, any notice that that any defense counsel intended to use these so we can Or the state's them. intended to use any of them. Or the state's intention okay. to use any of them so that we could um, <clears throat> have argument on those. So the convictions that I believe should not come in are as follows. 
09 SC 82479, <clears throat> which was a September 1st, 2009 conviction. Four. Um, Four. That one was for theft by taking. <clears throat> okay. Enter an auto and other charges. <clears throat> oh, well, you know, if you plead for that. So to make sure that he didn't plead to, you know, in, in all candor, Your Honor, I believe he did plead to giving false info. So, like, so he, so for the 09 case, he did plead to giving false information. So they would be able to use that for the limited portion of the fact that he did plead to giving false information. <clears throat> yes, that part would be. That uh, part would be. Would, would be admitted. <clears throat> the next case we have, Your Honor, is 10 SC 8. 87662. And he pled in 2010, but he ended up pleading to a misdemeanor. <laughs> um, he pled to misdemeanor theft by receiving. <clears throat> the next is 10 SC 96. 10 SC 96. 938. Okay. And that plea was taken on March 7th, 2011. And the charge was aggravated assault and possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony. <clears throat> and then the next one is 12 SC 110195. He pled to this in August of 2013. And he pled to entering auto, several counts, misdemeanor criminal trespass, misdemeanor obstruction, misdemeanor theft by taking. And then on that same day, he also pled to 12 SC 113315. Um, he pled to that on August 13, 2013. And there he pled to terroristic threats, aggravated and aggravated assault and battery. <clears throat> then Your Honor, he also had two, another case which was Null Prost, which was 12 SC. 113001. And another case, which was Null Prost, 13 SC. Oh, excuse me, this was a re indictment of that 12 SC case. So the number was three, 13 SC 120161. <laughs> What kind of cases were those, madam? Um, those were, <clears throat> it was a possession of MDMA and possession of marijuana less than an ounce. <clears throat> and the 13 SC was a re-indictment. Re <clears throat> All right. And so we believe the admissible convictions, and I can put that on the record, Gerana. <clears throat> Would be 15 SC. One three six seven nine four, in which he pled to that in December of two thousand eighteen, and the charge was theft by receiving stolen property. The next is twenty SC one seven six eight five one, and he pled on January twenty fifth, two thousand twenty two. <laughs> sure. The indictment number or the date? 20 SC 176851. You're welcome. And he pleads the possession of a vehicle with an altered VIN and misdemeanor um, obstruction of law enforcement officers. 
Next is 20SC176912. And he pled on January 26, 2022. And he pled to possession of a controlled substance schedule one or two with the intent to distribute. And then last is 22SC 182134, which he pled to on June 29, 2023. One more time. What was that last number? I'm sorry. 20. 22SC 182134. And he pled to possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. And that was on June 29, 2023. And you're right, there's also a federal indictment. I do not, but he pledged that federal indictment in 2015. And so that indictment would be right. As, I, I'll get you the federal indictment number. Have you shown these, um, the, the non-qualifying and qualifying convictions to uh, defense counsel? I have not. All right. Can you let them take a look at it? And... Oh, oh, they have. Oh, yeah, we did provide. Okay, what do you, um, what do you have a disagreement as to what, well, which matter? I, I, okay, thank you, Your Honor. Um, first of all, we are looking um, through, through the court's records. Okay, Mr. Still says he has it. Um, we did file a motion of intent to impeach with uh, convictions over 10 years old, so we're going to have to address that. But... Uh, specifically, two of the convictions that the state says are over 10 years old, um, I disagree with. And that's because the, the statute reads from the, my understanding of the statute, and I think the plain reading of the statute, the clock is from the last incarceration. Is, um, it, is it either or? Well, it's, it's. The one that's the statute, the statute the furthest in time, 10, the 10 years has to elapse from the last incarceration. When that comes into play is when probation is revoked, when there's a split section, when there's a split sentence and then probation is revoked. And I can get you the cases, but your honor, um, 12 SC 110195, as well as 12 SC 113315, um, we would agree that the plea was entered over 10 years ago. However, on the court's records, uh, those probations, the probation was revoked on 2 15 He was in custody at the time. So he's been incarcerated on those charges. The, the purpose of the statute is that the, the person has to maintain um, a history of lawful behavior uh, to to uh, reestablish that they are not essentially a convicted felon. And what are you talking about? I'm, I just, just so I can pull it out. But which one are you talking about? It, I, I don't have the number. This is the impeachment by prior conviction. 609B? 609B. 609 609B. 609 So, Your Honor, the statute says, or release from confinement, whichever is the later date, is, is what I was referring to in the statute, the plain language of the statute. Thank you, sir. Ms. Hilton, I am in possession of Mr. Steele's notice and Mr. Sharp's notice dated 10-23 of 2020. It was actually filed or e-filed 10-24 of 2023, giving notice of intent to impeach by conviction greater than 10 years. 
pursuant to 24-6-609. So it seems like the, the notices were in fact given timely. I'll include it as the next court exhibit in order. Um, the only thing I have to do is uh, do a 403 balancing test. So is there any reason why they wouldn't necessarily be the prejudice, prejudicial? Um, they're more, pre is there any reason why they wouldn't be um, more probative than prejudicial? Prejudicial and probative, I should say. Yeah, I would ask for Mr. Steele and Mr. Steele, either one make them. Mr. Steele, Mr. Shard, make the argument because they're asking for the compounding of it. Um, we believe that it is more. I'm sorry. We believe that these are more substantially prejudicial than probative, um, and so I would ask for them to propound their argument so we can respond. Yeah, I have to. I have to. I have to consider that as the last thing for the convictions that are over more than ten years old, unless they fall into the category of crime and falsity or, or. Um, I, I understand, Your Honor. I would say though. I, I think we have to also analyze what, what I just announced about the two convictions. Those are not over 10 years old. Um, based on the plain language of the statute, also, uh, I, sir, you know, this is my notes to these cases. So, um, but it's service of time for parole violation, counts as confinement for prior convictions and calculation for the 10 year period. Um, that's US v. Gray, 852. Fed 2nd, 136, it's a 1988 case out of the 4th District, and U.S. v. McClintock, 748 Federal 2nd, 1278, uh, it's a 1984 case out of the 9th. Yeah, anything District. more recent from our Supreme Court? I don't think Court, it's really... From our Supreme Court that's talked about the, the date of incarceration. Um, I just need, I just wanted to know, I mean, I'm familiar with the, with the rules well, in I, general I, about, and, pro, and being incarcerated, uh, and not completed those particular periods of probation extends the time. If you have a probation revocation, that extends the time. Right. So it's, it's, it's upon completion, which is ever greater. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Weinstein to the rescue, uh, Williams v. State, 302 Georgia, 474, uh, at 482. And that's a 2017 case. Uh, Williams so, versus the state? Yep. And yes, what is it again? Uh, 302 Georgia 474, I believe his handwriting is, or is that not? 474 uh, at 482, and that's a 2017 case out of the Supreme Court of Georgia, um, I believe is going to stand for that same proposition. And as, as I said, uh, that would apply to 12 SC. If my understanding of the court records, um, you know, we pulled these cases and pulled the probation revocations for these cases. That would apply to 12 SC 110195 and 12 SC 113315. Those would now come within the 10 year uh, time limit. And. It's a statute. Is it defined? Yes. And, and also, Your Honor, just the plain reading of the statute, um, it defines time limit and it says. Um, Evidence of conviction under this code shall not be admissible if a period of more than 10 years has elapsed since the date of the conviction or of the release of the witness from the confinement imposed of such conviction, whichever the later date, unless the court determines in the interest of justice that the probative value of the conviction support, supported by specific facts and circumstances substantially outweighs the prejudicial effect. So um, the time limit is... The plain reading of the statute says um, either the date of the conviction or uh, release of witness from confinement imposed by such conviction, whichever is a later date, which is why I think that probably this isn't litigated that often because the plain language of the statute is pretty clear. I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm good. Okay. Your Honor, and Mr. Sharkin showed me, I believe, 
and we're thus double checking right now. The one one. We would agree with the one one three one five because it looks like he was revoked and required to do six months on. 12-18-2020, so right. if he was in confinement, even if it was for six months, 10 years would be 2030. However, and what we're double checking, Your Honor, is on 12-SC-110195, that the probation warrant was canceled in March of 2015, so we're <clears throat> checking to see if my, he was actually revoked on a one If If this helps, on the 195, my notes, um, and we have a big pile of papers back there, but my notes say the probation was revoked on 2-21-15. That's what, that's what Mr. Steele's motion indicates. Plea was on 12 August of 2013, probation revoked on or about February the 21st of 2015. In all, all candor, our, our motion is based on, it's the same source as my notes, but, um, but yes, that's our belief. So what we're speaking on? We're looking at obviously that's what we're double checking. We don't see an order. We see that a warrant was canceled. That's what we're looking for to see if there was an order um, for the probation matter. Yeah, yeah. So what we have in Odyssey is that there was no revocation for um, 12 SC 110195. Mr. Steele, uh, do you have any documentation showing there was, in fact, a revocation? Well, we don't have access to Odyssey, Your Honor. Um, and that's the. So where did you get the date, though? That's why I'm, that's why I'm trying to find out. If you, you put it please. So do you have some documents to rely upon? I see this. the state has shown me a probation warrant cancellation. Um, so the question is, I'm trying to figure out if, clearly if it was revoked even for time served, it would fall under the 10 years. I would just ask for a little bit of time. You know, the state kind of decided to address this now. I'm not blaming them, but we didn't really know that this was going to just be addressed at this exact moment. So I would just ask for some time to look into the clerk's file and try to figure out um, where we got that date from. Clearly, we, we got that date and, and, you know, perhaps it was just seeing the probation warrant, but, you know, I wouldn't concede that point. Um, and then the state said that they're going to email what they have on Odyssey, which we don't have access to. I, I'd assume we probably went to the public computers in the law library and, and tried to do it through there. All right. So regarding, so my understanding where we are right now, the three, 315, the state has conceded that that falls within the 10 years, so that's not on the <laughs> table. The 0195 may or may not be on the table, depending on what we learn about that case. Um, but um, for the ones outside the 10-year, we did give timely notice. You did. And so that's going to be a uh, balancing uh So to address, though, tell me why okay. they're more probative than prejudicial at this point in time. Well, for prejudice, it, it's a bit confusing um, to me because I don't know who would be prejudiced by the truth about Mr. Copeland's prior convictions coming out. Certainly, he wouldn't be prejudiced. Uh, he's been given immunity. He's not a party to this case. So I don't really see any real prejudice. Um, but the probative value um, towards his credibility um, first of all, I'd point out that one of these cases, 09 SC 82479, um, not only involved giving false info, which is very probative of one's credibility, but also involved a theft, um, a car theft. Thefts 
are viewed as more probative to credibility than um, other non uh, crimes that involve some level of deceit or dishonesty. So uh, the fact that it's a theft makes it uh, particularly uh, probative towards credibility. But um, also, Your Honor, Mr. Copeland is the key witness to a number of acts in this case. He's really one of the key witnesses of the case, if not the key witness. His credibility is the crux of this case. He's the linchpin of this case. I anticipate that he's probably going to be on the on the stand for a week or more. Um, so one of the factors that we take into account when we're doing a balancing test is the importance of the witness's credibility towards this case. And his credibility and the ability to of the jurors to consider his entire history, his um, and his entire criminal history is paramount to assessing his credibility. And I'll point out, Your Honor, one other thing that I think is relevant towards the probative value of credibility. If Mr. Copeland was someone who, say, had an 09SC82479 case and had a conviction and then, um, you know, learned from that conviction, turned his life around, went about, got a job, wherever, was working, taking care of his children and taking care of his family and just living a law-abiding life, I think the argument would be stronger for it lacks probative value. But he hasn't done that. He's continued to commit crimes, to violate the law, to lie, um, to commit crimes indicative of a lack of credibility. So this tells the whole story. And um, I don't know why we wouldn't give the jurors the whole story about a man's history and his lack of credibility when his credibility is ultimately so important in this case. I don't know what he's going to testify to, but um, I do know that there's a possibility that things he said are going to come out and the jurors need to know, can we believe this guy or not? And they need to have the full story about Kenneth <clears throat> okay. and his criminal history. All right, sir. State, you wish to respond or? Your Honor, I don't believe them having the full history is what they, what will determine his credibility. They have at now five convictions that they can impeach Mr. Copeland on. Um, the issue is, is he a convicted felon? He is. And they have five convictions. These other four from 2009 and 2010 would be substantially prejudicial in this case, given that they have more recent charges for which he was convicted of. Um, these charges, again, are theft by taking. They already have a, a theft case that they can use to impeach him if they choose to do that. Um, the other one is in ag assault, and the other is an entering auto. I want to be clear that there is the 10 SC 87662 case, which he pled to a misdemeanor, which they could not use um, because he only got 12 months in custody um, on a theft. That's one, the theft by receiving stolen property. That's the theft by receiving. 10 SC 87662. Correct. So the three cases, the three indictments that we're looking at, I believe is 09 SC 82479, 10 SC 96938, and the 12 SC 110195. What about the 9 CR 35? And then there's 4 4. It's 4 4 4 4. Oh, 9 CR, that would be a misdemeanor because that would be solicitors. If it's, if it's 09 CR, that would be a solicitor general's right. case. What about the 09 SC uh, 824? Seven nine. Seven nine. Yes, Your Honor. So the three cases that we're looking at, Your Honor, is O two excuse me, O nine SC eight two four seven nine, ten SC nine six nine three eight, and twelve SC one one zero one nine five. No, they usually bring that up. She has to do that with me. She didn't do that. She didn't do that.
In response to what the state just said, I would just reiterate when they talk about prejudice, prejudice to who would be my first question. But also, Your Honor, regarding um, regarding the uh, misdemeanors, the state is suggesting that there's a ban on misdemeanors, if, you know, if they're not felonies. But I would point, Your Honor, to 246609A2, which reads evidence, this is what can be used to impeach as far as convictions. It says evidence that any witness has been convicted of a crime shall be admitted regardless of punishment. If it readily can be determined that establishing the elements of such it's crime. in excess of one year. So it's got to be in excess of one year. Or Mr. Mayor, that's why Mr. Mayors are usually disqualified. I, I don't, where, I'm sorry, Your Honor, where are you seeing excess one year? 24-6-609 for purposes of attacking character on truth. Right, but under A2, not A1, A2. A2. Allows, it, it, it's for crimes of dishonesty. The elements of such crime require proof or admission of an act of dishonesty or making a false statement. Yeah, but so what are, are these misdemeanors? They're misdemeanor theft by receiving and thefts. Those are dishonesty. Okay. All right. So I, I, I just, and I just wanted to say, so I, I don't agree with the wholesale uh, just conclusion that misdemeanors are not admissible. Okay. So the misdemeanors that involve theft, we, we the court is of the opinion, I would agree with you that they'd be admissible. Right. And so, because they're because they're dishonesty. Yes, Sean. Because they're dishonesty. Uh, say shaking head, but no, they're dishonest. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're dishonest. All right. So. We have a case law. We have any other case Well, then, so, then, then come on. Then, we, bring it. Stop sitting back there and and, and holding your tongue. Then tell me what it is. Two eighty four Georgia Appeals five thirty four. Say again. Hold on. Go ahead. What is it? 284. Georgia Appeals 534. And it says for impeachment purposes, crimes of dishonesty were limited to those crimes that bear upon a witness's propensity to testify truthfully. According to misdemeanor theft by receiving stolen property, it was not a crime involving dishonesty. Yeah, that's what it says, Mr. Sharp. But the given false name is, though. Given false name is? Yes. Sir. Yes. Okay. That's a 2007 case, which I believe is under the old evidence code. And, change. and it also has, I'm, I'm just trying to, it's got a big yellow triangle. Okay, and what is that case? Case is still good law, Your Honor, and that crimes of dishonesty do not include theft by receiving. I would concur, Mr. Sharp. I'm going to go ahead and uh, exclude those particular misdemeanors, okay? Okay. Right. Um, so I, I say okay, not. Yeah, you, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah, you've objected. Um, you, you can have a continuing objection. I yes. certainly understand for purposes of uh, review. Okay? I should say I understand the court's rule. Okay. All right. Um, Regarding 09 SC 82479, 10 SC 96938, um, we still have the probative value of credibility versus prejudice balancing that Your Honor needs to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rule that they're more probative than prejudicial, okay? Thank you. All right. Thank you. 
And that applies to 12 SC 110. I mean, that was one we weren't sure if it falls within the 10 years or not. That would apply. Well, you don't know whether or not uh, it does it. Does, have you found out whether or not? It's... Well, if, it, if you find it's more probative than, pre than prejudicial, then it really doesn't matter. Which one are you talking about? 12 SC 110195. It's that's the uh, entering what? autos. And the probation, I, th I, I felt it was revoked. And I asked to look into it to see if it occurred within the 10 years. But if your honor is finding these prior convictions I, more probative, more, it then it probative really doesn't than matter. prejudicial, so it wouldn't make a difference okay. at that point. Thank okay. you. You're allowing them in, your honor? I'm allowing them in. Thank I'm allowing them in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Why? You're calling in the jury, your honor. Can I just take a comfort break? If I can <laughs> call the jury in, I can do it at the same time. All right. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take 10 minutes and uh, take a couple of break and uh, we'll see where that we'll see where the day leads us at that point in time. OK, anything else I need to take up with you all before um, Mr. Copeland comes testifies as our next witness? Yes, Your Honor. Um, two things. First, I don't believe that anyone in defense has a copy of the immunity, the order granting immunity. Um, I believe that we're entitled to that. So we would ask for that. Um, additionally, Your Honor, um, we are going to diligently over the lunch hour, um, myself and other counsel, uh, look at these state's exhibits. Last week, we discussed that we had some objections, to, if, if you recall, and we kind of put a pin in it because the state said that it was just a large amount and they were going to narrow it down what they were admitting or seeking to admit. Well, now we have a PowerPoint. It looks, it looks like they redacted some of the things that were going to be our concerns, but I'm just going to ask, I, I hope your honor understands we just received this and we're going to over lunch, look at the proposed exhibits. And, um, if we have any specific <laughs> objections mm -hmm. after their redactions, we'll bring that to your honor's attention if that's okay. That's what you told me, so I, I certainly I certainly understand that. Um, right. So, what what happened since that that hearing or that discussion was the state did make some redactions, and I think that addressed possibly all of our issues, but at least some of them. Um, but I just we just received this, so we'll report back to the court whenever the whenever your honor wants to. Okay, hear but remember, us. our jury's been here some since eight thirty. No, I understand that. So I, I'd like to kind of go ahead and get started. Well, if, if Your Honor wants to go through these one by one, we, we can. We just literally oh, you just can do that during lunch. That's fine. Okay, I mean, okay. But, but, you know, this is, you know, I know that you all were, we should have been working on these prior to that. So, okay. Yes, we, we just got this. Okay, but you had the larger exhibit for the. And we brought those to your attention last week. Yeah, and... I remember. Okay. I remember. Okay. All right. Um, all right, Deputy Ham, summon our jurors, please. Mr. Melnick and uh, Mr. Copeland. He's waiting. Okay. All right.
Yeah, no, Mr. Melvin, he's been gone for about 30 and 35 minutes. <coughs> Can we uh, call him, please? Or tell him that we are uh, going to need him back for one for one fifteen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Uh, thank you, Deputy Ham. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, I know you all sound weak. I know I know you've been uh, wondering, well, what are they doing? I, I remember I told you there are times that we have to work, and uh, and this morning has been one of those such times. So please, as we've indicated before, thank you for your patience. Um, given that I, I, I just wanted you all to know that we hadn't forgotten about you, but that we are going to go ahead and formally just break for lunch at this point in time. Okay, so what I'm going to have you do is um, come back for one fifteen. It's about almost 12.15 right now. Come back for 1.15. We'll go ahead and uh, see where the day leads us at that point in time, okay? Yes, sir. All right. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll be in recess till 1.15. We'll see you then, okay? All rise. All right. Sergeant Brown, all our jurors present? Yes, sir. Deputy Ham, jurors here. Okay. All right. Deputy Ham, can you check on our jurors, please? Mr. Steele, what can I do for you? Okay, all right. John, just just a reminder, uh, there are some issues with the closing statements. I don't know if the state's playing that today, but I just want to give you a heads up. You're right, we're going to pass them out, and I think we can deal with them after. Okay, all right. She said uh, you, we, you'll deal with it. She'll deal with them as they come, as they're introduced, so. Everybody ready to All right. Summon our jurors, please. All right, 
right, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. All right, thank you, uh, Deputy Ham. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, the jury, good afternoon. Yeah, All right. Without further delay, we're going to go ahead and call the next witness. State. Ms. Hilton calls Kenneth Copeland to the stand. All right, summon Mr. Copeland, please. Your Honor, here is Dax. Mr. Copeland is. Your Honor. I, I, here it comes. All right, Mr. Copeland, go ahead and approach the witness stand. Before you sit down, if you would turn and face uh, Deputy Han to be sworn as a witness. You swear a firm testimony to everybody. What is the truth? The whole truth, nothing but the truth, sir. Yes. Let me see if you state your first and last name with the spelling of both, please. You say that again? State your first and last name with the spelling of both, please. Uh, uh, Kenneth Copeland. Mr. Copeland, do me a favor, pull your chair up as close as you can to the microphone and speak directly into it so we can all hear you. So if you could state and spell your first and last name for the record, please. Kenneth Copeland. Spell it, please. K-E-N-N-E-T-H-C-O-P-E-L-A-N-D. Thank you, sir. All right. And hey, Mr. Copeland, good afternoon. Do you want to be here? Ma'am? Do you want to be here? I'm here. Okay. Well, are you going to let me ask you some questions? Okay. How old are you? Grown. Okay. What does grown mean? I'm an adult. Okay. And when you say you're an adult, what number in years are you? I plead the fifth. Ladies and gentlemen, can I get you to step outside to your headquarters of jury deliberation, please? From All right. From here. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Our jury has left us. Uh, Mr. Copeland, given the fact that you have invoked your Fifth Amendment privilege, but the state has already given you immunity under 24-5-507, this court holds you in willful contempt, and uh, we'll see you on Monday. And we'll see, we'll see if we uh, can get some more testimony at that point in time. Take them into custody. All right. State, do you have any other witnesses you plan on calling this afternoon? No, Your Honor. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do is I'll call our jury and tell them that we're going to you're going to be in recess for the for the weekend, and we'll uh, we'll we'll come back on Monday. And then, Your Honor, the jury is excused. Would you please entertain a motion for a mistrial? <laughs> um, Mr. Steele, I'll, I'll entertain it right now. I, I didn't want to hold the jury, but that'll be fine. And what's the basis for your mistrial? We didn't know he was going to invoke. We didn't know what he was going to testify to. And I certainly didn't let him. He only had, was only asked one question. So at this point in time, there's really, I mean, you can't knowingly let a witness invoke their Fifth Amendment privilege under the, in front of a jury. But that didn't happen in this case. Last thing we heard from Mr. Colton was he was going to testify. So everything you say, I'll adopt because I was about to say those words. Based upon information belief, I'd like to call witnesses from the prosecution. I was told, I, have, I do not have the personal information, but I was told that Mr. Copen made that known to officers of the prosecution team prior to being called right now. And but, it's what I, but it's what I was told. I mean, he, he, the last thing the court knew, um, and he has counsel. If, if a party knows that a witness is going to invoke the Fifth Amendment in front of a jury, which poisons us, I mean, there's no doubt it prejudices Mr. <clears throat> Williams et al., all of them, because this trial's been going on now, I believe, eight months in front of a jury, 
and they've heard Mr. Copeland's name however many times a court reporter says. Casey, that's what we've heard. No, so. the jurors have heard Kenneth Copeland. Uh, and, and as well, okay. I opened on him that he's the killer. Um, we cross-examined all these witnesses about Kenneth Copeland. The state talked about Kenneth Copeland. My point is, if this honorable court finds that the state knew or had reason to believe that he was going to do this in front of a jury, that his response was going to be, I'm invoking the Fifth Amendment, then, Your Honor, yes, I adopt what you said. That's wrong of a party, and I'm moving for mistrial. Okay. Okay. Sorry, All right, sir. Thank you. All right. Your Honor, the argument was in fact just... Yes, sir. It would apply to everyone. Yes, uh, Ms. Love. Your Honor, I'd just like to put some things on the record sure. regarding um, Mr. Copeland. Um, as we stated earlier, Mr. Copeland I, I, has... I don't want to interrupt you. Your Honor, I... I'm just telling the court I am not accepting the proffer. Your Honor, if I may. Okay, but counsel I mean, gets I, the proffer, Mr. Steele. That's my, I can accept that. So um, could you sit down at that time, sir? Sit down. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, Ms. Love, you can complete your proffer at this point. Your Honor, yes. Um, just to relate to the court the observations that um, members of our office have made throughout the course of this morning and throughout the time that we've been dealing with Mr. Copeland. Um, our cause for concern is Mr. Copeland's communication um, that he is going to, to us, that he is going to um, speak, um, that he is going to speak on the stand, that he is going to testify, and watching what happens when Mr. Copeland <clears throat> gets on the stand. Um, Mr. Copeland did not want to have to be taken into custody. Um, the court gave him the opportunity to have present in court with him someone who is supposed to be representing his best interests. Um, what we have seen is communication, both verbal and nonverbal, between Mr. Copeland's supposed counsel and counsel for defendants. And a look as if I tried from Mr. Copeland's supposed counsel in the direction of counsel for the defendants after Mr. Melnick attempted to assert for Mr. Copeland, Mr. May I finish? Uh, let her finish, Mr. Melnick. Please sit down. And I'll let you start. All right, thank okay. You. okay. All right. Thank All right. you, sir. While Mr. Copeland is on the stand stating that he wants to testify, that he will testify rather. So we are watching, and Mr. Melnick, it's, I believe it may even be captured on film. The court can look at it. Mr. Melnick turns to the direction of counsel for the defendants and motions like, I, I, that's it. Then, upon information and belief, as we are standing out waiting for the jury to come in, Mr. Copeland requests to speak with counsel for the state, but Mr. Melnick keeps walking in, walking in, walking in, walking in. Then, as does he any Mr. Point Copeland... Tell you, does he any point in time tell you I'm not going to testify? Or no, oh, no, I'm going to invoke the Fifth Amendment. No. As what happens, as Mr. Copeland requested to speak with the state, <laughs> he keeps, Mr. Melnick keeps going in, regardless of Mr. Copeland's request to speak with the state. And then we learn that Mr. Melnick tells Mr. Copeland they are going to hammer you. So Ms. Hilton comes back in and asks me, had I spoken with Mr. Melnick? Um, had I told him that we are going to hammer Mr. Copeland? The state had not made any such communication with anybody. So what we are seeing, we believe, is tampering with witnesses, this particular witness on the part of people who are not the state. So we are concerned. I don't know that Mr. Copeland's interest is being represented when that interest may not be in alignment with the people that Mr. Melnick is communicating with on breaks and after Mr. Copeland has communicated to this court, he will testify. So watching the goings on as Mr. Copeland is not on the stand, it has been publicized, it has been hyped up that Mr. Copeland is the next witness. Mr. Copeland is the witness. And then Mr. Copeland, he's been nothing but cordial. He's been nothing but communicative with Ms. Hilton during the time that she has been interviewing him and speaking with him. And the reason Ms. Hilton was not in here just now 
when the jury came out is that Mr. Copeland asked to speak with Ms. Hilton. But Mr. Melnick kept going back in there and going back in there and going back in there. And the reason that we have a problem with this is that Mr. Copeland is not facing any charges. For Mr. Melnick to suggest or say to him that we're going to hammer him, it causes us to call into question whose interests he's representing. And so we would ask that, you know, what I, I haven't even thought of in my mind an appropriate remedy at this point because it is wrong for parties to inject themselves on behalf of purportedly one person and, and, and I don't know, um, I guess they're, you know, collab, I don't know what's going on, but I can say that this entire day, starting from the point at which Mr. Melnick is invoking Mr. Copeland's Fifth Amendment right after Mr. Copeland has said he's going to testify, <clears throat> has gone a little off rails and it's a little bit concerning. So, Your Honor, I, as, as to this motion for a mistrial, we would argue that it's, it's caused by actions on the part of people other than the state that Mr. Copeland got here and said what he did. So we will continue to speak with Mr. Copeland because Mr. Copeland doesn't have any charges that are open. If he asks to speak with us, which he has, we'll go and speak with him. That, and I don't, I'm not even certain what is going on behind me with respect to persons who are purporting to represent the best interests of Mr. Copeland. But it would appear to me that Mr. Copeland's best interest would be served by Mr. Copeland not being inside the Fulton County Jail. But that's just my opinion. So, Your Honor, I would ask that the court deny the motion for a mistrial um, at, at the very least. And if it goes any further, find that actions caused, actions by people other than the state have led to us being where we are. Because Mr. Copeland was at the point right before lunch of agreeing to testify. That is the reason we were ready to get started, right before lunch. Because now he's been told he's going to be hammered by his attorney, I guess. He told him that I guess the state's going to hammer him. I don't even know what. But Ms. Hilton has um, gone over the questions that she has for Mr. Copeland. She has spoken with him about it. They have, um, <laughs> they have been speaking cordially with one another. And this idea that somehow someone is entitled to mistrial as a result of this action on the part of Mr. Copeland is a farce under these circumstances. We'd ask that the court deny the motion. All right. I am going to deny the motion for mistrial, Mr. Steele, at this point in time. I'll note that you've, uh, you've made it. Um, and, uh, I'll let Mr. Melnick in just a second um, make whatever remarks he wants. Do you have anything else you want to say? Yeah, I, I would like, but I, my understanding is, I'm going to profit this, but there's a great investigator who is looking at me and I trust her. I'd like to call her as a witness. I was told I was not there. I was told that, and I forget her name, I know her first name, but her last name. Ms. Um, and investigator law, and I may be wrong. Um, heard Mr. Copeland prior to coming in to the courtroom, almost immediately prior, state, and I'm I'm reading from Mr. Kokomo. If I have to go to jail, then lock me up. And then the Honorable David Box, the Honorable David Box told me as I was walking in that he heard, and he's right behind me, so he should be speaking for himself, but he heard Kenneth Copeland tell the prosecution, if I said the wrong people, please correct it, that he's invoking the fifth. That's why I raised it. I'm not saying anybody did anything wrong. I'm saying that if a party knows or has a reason to believe that a witness may invoke the Fifth Amendment in front of a jury, we avoid that at all costs. But the challenge we're having, Mr. Steele, is I do believe that there's probably been some probably behavior that uh, probably wouldn't pass the the good faith test of um of there's a lot of influences inside and outside so i'm going to basically base it on the proffers of counsel and just remind you all of your professional responsibility requirements okay well, so I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm gonna remind it all the time because i live them i'm just telling the court that in order for you to deny my motion for a mistrial, this is bad. This is I, and I'm going to deny your motion, and I've made my ruling. So 
I'm, 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 I'm done at this point in time, okay? In terms of this motion for mistrial. Well, I'd like to call the witnesses, but I understand what you're saying. I'm not going to call any witnesses. I don't need any witnesses. Your proffers are fine, okay? Can I add a proffer, Mark? Yes. Okay. Um, as you know, we are in a side room off the hallway on the first floor. That's where defense counsel is kind of their conference room. Um, during lunch, uh, I'm working on unrelated matters, and I'm going to get a ginger ale to calm my upset stomach. And I'm on the phone, but I'm hearing a gentleman speak very loudly on the phone with agents from the state. My belief agents from the state were present within earshot. And that gentleman on the phone who was Kenneth Copeland was making it. How do you know it was on the phone? If it, if it was Kenneth Copeland's on the phone, was he talking on the phone or? He's standing in the hallway 10 feet from me, practically screaming in the phone. Oh, so Mr. Copeland's on the phone. Yes. Okay. And you're overhearing this particular report of conversation. Testifying. I'm not testifying. I'm not giving a direct quote because I was on the phone handling my own business and I was okay, but no interactions with Okay, but Mr. here's the thing. I think, I think it's consistent with. I'm not testifying, okay? He can make a decision not to testify, okay? But if he does so, and he, I mean, because he's already been told, look, you can invoke your Fifth Amendment privilege, and, and, if you, and you've been given immunity, and if you don't, I told him what the consequences are this morning. That's consistent with what I've heard so thus far, and I don't think that that is... I believe that the state was on notice that something like this was going to Okay, happen. all right. But all of you have kind of, like I said, either unwittingly or from, I just remind you from outside agitation or otherwise, you all need to stay away from any of this. You do, both sides need to do this. Do not let outside influences, you know, influence your actions and get you in trouble. You all should rise to a higher standard in terms of don't, don't let any of this stuff. I mean, these are, these, these witnesses will testify to whatever they're going to testify to. So. I didn't say you did anything wrong. Okay, but I didn't. I didn't. I didn't say you did anything wrong. But okay. But I just want to be clear. The only thing that I've heard today is that the state met met with Kenneth Copeland without his attorney. I, I Are we going back to that again? I thought we. I don't know of any okay. counsel that's had any conversations with Kenneth Copeland at all. And I just want to make that clear. Today, I don't know of anyone that's had conversations with Okay, but, but he's their witness at this point in time. He, if he wants to talk to you or he doesn't want to talk to you, he's got a lawyer. And that lawyer can make that decision, and so can Mr. So can Mr. Copeland. So situation because we have I, I understand that, but you can't let other people, and I would advise you not to let third parties influence what you may think a witness is going to do. That's not happening. Okay, and that's all I was trying to tell you, okay? Okay. All right. I would like to hear. Yes, sir. What is it you'd like to tell me, Mr. Malnick? Judge, I went back and reviewed my communications with the Fulton County District Attorney's Office in relation to Kenneth Copeland, and I found communications as late as June 5th of last year where the Fulton County District Attorney's Office had reached out to me about speaking to Mr. Copeland speaking to Mr. Copeland concerning this trial, not about any other case, speaking with Mr. Copeland about this trial. Neither of these attorneys, no attorney at this table has ever attempted to contact me about Mr. Copeland and about his willingness or desire to testify at this trial. They have put us in this position where at the last minute, I'm trying to advise him as best I can what I think is best for him. Had they exercised the slightest bit of professional conduct, we would not be sitting here having this conversation today. And unfortunately, for me to fully explain everything that's been going on, it would require me to reveal confidences that I'm not going to reveal. I don't want you to do that, sir. I, I can assure you, you that the decision to invoke the fifth came completely from Kenneth Copeland. I owe nothing okay, but to anybody over here. I owe nothing to anybody at any of these tables. I don't care, candidly, no offense, don't <laughs> care what happens with their cases. The only thing I care about is what happens to Kenneth Copeland. 
And, and for that, any assertion, sir, I'm sorry, Judge. For and, sir, any that's assertion, your, and, that, and, that's, and that's your primary duty. It is. That's exactly right. And for an assertion to be made that I or Mr. Copeland are somehow being influenced by somebody over here is absolutely ridiculous. I take great offense to it, and I can tell Ms. Love that I am going to the state bar to report her for contacting a witness that she knows to be represented by counsel. She and I have had conversations about Kenneth Copeland. Okay, and sir, and sir, that that is whatever you decide to do um, outside of what the court uh, court is ruling upon. Remember, the court can only rule upon what I what I see. I'm okay, sure. and what I see at this point in time is a, a witness who, for whatever reason, may have some other reasons um, about about his testimony. He has expressed those this morning. He said, I'm going to invoke my Fifth Amendment privilege. Mm -hmm. The state came came to came to me and said, OK, listen, we would like you to sign an immunity order under 24-5-507. They make that decision. So I, so there are I mean, I think that gets us to the point where we knew that or at some point in time that the state knew that, they, that he was he was he yeah. was going to invoke his Fifth yeah. Amendment privilege. So they absolutely. Knew it. So but in order for them to in order for them to still get this testimony, which they believe that they need, they offer him immunity. So that's what we explained to your client this morning. So whether or not he wishes to go ahead and and still invoke his privilege, that's his choice. But the statute's pretty clear. I understand. If and, and I know you, probably, and I know you. I've known you, sir, for two for at least two two decades mm -hmm. or more, sir. And I know that you would have you have told him, hey, look, if you invoke. You'll this is probably what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And 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 I suspect that if you probably have a conversation with him now, you're probably going to tell him, well, that was a self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of what I told you might happen. But I don't know what conversations you have with him, but I suspect that they were consistent with what the dictates of 24-5-507. Um, now, Monday, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and... Call, I'll call him out before the jury comes in to, uh, on Monday morning. And we'll ask him whether or not he wishes to continue his testimony because I don't want him to invoke in front of this jury if he, if he, if, um, I can help it. So since he's made it once already, I'm going to ask him before the jury gets out here to more, uh, on Monday, is he your intent to invoke your Fifth Amendment privilege? If it is, he's going to go back into custody until he's willing to go ahead and give testimony because he has immunity, so he has to testify. Judge, the only thing that I would say is that the reason, the, the primary reason Mr. Copeland is in custody right now is because the state has utterly failed to follow up with me in any regard re with regard to what Mr. Copeland wants to do or intends to do. I it is, it is, that's probably not true. I it is grossly knowing, unfair. I, like I've known you for almost two decades. Um, I've known Miss Hilton and Miss Love in particular for for for. For a long period of time, and I don't, I don't think that they would do that to you. Uh, and Judge, at no point did they ever reach out to me about Mr. Copeland, Honor, about Mr. Copeland's testimony here today. The last time I heard from anybody in the Fulton DA's office was June of last year. Ms. Hilton, did you reach out to 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 Mr. Melnick? And if so, when? When I talked to Mr. Copeland, he told me Mr. Melnick was not his attorney. So that is, I talked to the witness for, because when did you talk to Mr. Mr. Copeland? Last Friday, because my understanding prior to that is that Mr. Melnick had told Ms. Love that he wasn't his attorney. So when we went to go serve him, the, or I understand that he did not have an attorney. When I met with Mr. Copeland, Mr. Copeland, and this is Friday evening, Mr. Long and I went to go meet with him in the car. We said, hey, I think Mr. Melnick's your attorney. He said, Mr. Melnick is not my attorney. He said, I haven't even talked to him. And then that is when we proceeded to begin our conversations. Anytime Mr. Copeland did not want to speak with us, we did not speak with him. We called him on Monday to see if he could come down here. He said he didn't want, he said he didn't want to come or he didn't respond. We left it alone. On Tuesdays when we picked him up for the first time, on Tuesday when he did not take the stand, we went upstairs. We had some conversation. We left. He's, uh, Mr. Long took him back home and then yesterday he came back down here with us. Again, we showed him some, some of the evidence that we were going to show him. And that was the extent of it. And if at any time Mr. Copeland would have told us he wanted his attorney present, we would have called Mr. Melnick. But our understanding was, one, he was not his attorney. Mr. Melnick disavowed being his attorney. And Mr. Copeland told me he wasn't his attorney. So that is what I based all of my decisions 
after. It was not until 6 o'clock last night or whenever this email was sent from Mr. Melnick with Mr. Shard and Mr. Steele copied on it <sighs> that I get this idea that you've been talking to my client and then my client is going to plead the fifth, which brought us here today. That has been what has happened since last Friday, Your Honor. All right. So, so, so we have a witness that may not have been totally candid or 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 may or may not have thought that he potentially needed you and and as things developed mr Malnick, he decided well yeah he does need you but i you know whether or not and um, around this mind's understanding that mr Melnick called mr copeland last night so it wasn't that it wasn't that mr copeland called mr Melnick. mr Melnick so happens to call him the night before he's supposed to testify so i don't know what has happened or what has transpired but that is the extent of what occurred so i'm not going to get into my conversations <laughs> with my client no and i don't expect you to but i do but i do want to remind you mr Melnick, as well as i reminded both cassettes of counsel that you owe a higher duty of tribunal to me and the court than you do anybody else. So please don't, you know, you know, you, you, as a professional advocate, don't put yourself in a position where, um, where you come cross purposes with the rules. Okay. Of course. Uh, I mean, so, and that sometimes has to be explained to, to witnesses and, and clients. Okay. All right. So that's where we are at this point in time is that Monday morning, I will, I will bring Mr. Uh, Copeland back out. It is, uh, I don't re relish the fact of holding him in contempt, but that's all I have at this point in time because he's been given immunity. So, um, we'll, we'll take him up that, cause that's our first session of court. We won't be having anything else until then. And your honor, I would like to, um, ask that the court, um, convey to Mr. Melnick to convey to Mr. Copeland that he is subject to being committed and held in the Fulton County Jail until the end of this trial, because I'm certain Mr. Melnick, if he, if Mr. Melnick wants to convey to us some of the concerns that he has, Mr. Melnick has, I'm certain is quite familiar with the statute under which the court has compelled Mr. Copeland to provide testimony. So there is nothing that we could do to Mr. Copeland regarding any, any um, testimony we elicit from him on the stand pursuant to the court's order under the statute that the court has cited, 245507. <laughs> and that statute gives the court the ability and, and, and probably, you know, depending on how the court feels about it, the absolute duty given the necessity of Mr. Copeland's testimony to hold Mr. Copeland in the Fulton County Jail until he decides to purge himself of the contempt of court by providing testimony. If Mr. Melnick would like to speak with Ms. Hilton or any other member of the state regarding his concerns about that order, which tracks the statute almost verbatim, then I would invite him to do so. Otherwise, as I've stated, I don't see it being in Mr. Copeland's best interest to be confined to the Fulton County Jail until the end of this trial. But I will leave those matters to Mr. Melnick, who at this time is asserting that he is representing Mr. Copeland. But again, that was not the understanding that Mr. Copeland had previously given to us. All right. Okay, so Mr. Melnick, uh, if you do in fact talk with Mr. Copeland, um, like I said, I'll bring him back on Monday, and we'll see where we are at that point in time. Okay. And uh, he has the ability to purge himself by just providing testimony consistent with um, what he knows or what his knowledge of is in, in this case, okay? Judge, I have some personal matters that I need to convey to Chambers, but I'll do that off the record. Okay, I'm um, I'm going to recess in just a little bit, and uh, but um, can you be back uh, for Monday morning? That's just it. I can't. Uh, I, can I... Is this something I can take up off the record? Well, I, I, I kind of have to call him on Monday. I do. I mean, there's no choice. I have no choice because that is the next session of court. Judge, I have non-refundable tickets out of town on Monday. I can't be here. I cannot be here. And I, I, there is nothing I, I, I've had this on file with Fulton County since December 15th of last year. And again, had the state contacted me before Today, I would have made them aware of this. Well, there's one of those lawyer times a lawyer that you're going to probably have to kind of figure out a solution, sir. I mean, I, I don't want I don't I don't want to put you in this particular position. I, I can't I can't be here, Doug. I absolutely cannot be here. Well, you have a choice. You can be here if you want, but you'll just have to you'll have to figure out some other things to do with your with your with your tickets. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I I mean, 
Here's the thing. If you're asserting, if, Ms. if the state was relying upon the fact that you were not his counsel, you were not his counsel, and now you are, you have put us in a situation where, where now, you, I mean, you, you no, kind of, I mean, you put, you put yourself in between a rock and a hard place. I mean, so he's coming back on Monday. I'll have somebody else make my, then, then, me. then, then that can be done. And sir, I would advise you to do that. But remember, Mr. Mr. Copeland, you know, has to have some concurrence. So, Maybe before he leaves the, um, and goes actually to the Fulton County Jail, um, you may need to have a conversation with him about that so we're clear. And I'm clear as to whether or not you're coming back on Monday or somebody else is. I'll and, have I, somebody go on and I need to know who that lawyer is. Do you want to have a conversation with him before? I'm going to talk to him right now. All right, okay. I'm going to allow you to do that, and then I'll remain um, uh, and be available for, uh, for, for a di further discussion. So... Um, let me go ahead and let me go ahead and um, Sergeant Ham, can you uh, you and your colleagues uh, or Lieutenant Walker arrange for um, Mr. Melnick to talk with Mr. Copeland, please? Yeah. All right. And I'm going to go ahead and at this point in time. Um, summon our jurors, please. All right. All right, thank you, Sergeant Ham. Promote you already again. All right, okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, jury, good afternoon. Okay, it appears that we have some more homework to do, and given the fact that um, um, that needs to occur, uh, it, my suggestion is that we go ahead and recess you for the for the day. Okay, um, and let you begin your Friday. Ladies and gentlemen, um, Monday being a regular work day, what I'm going to have you do is report for 8.30 for a 9, 9 o'clock anticipated start time. And um, we'll see where the day leads us on Monday, okay? All right. Any minister inquiry of me, ladies and gentlemen? Anyone? Okay. All right. Um, All right, unless you have anything of me, ladies and gentlemen, let's go through your um, admonitions at this point in time. Remember, leave your notepads in the uh, in your headquarters, your jury deliberation room. Uh, please don't take them with you. Um, remember that as you leave here and you gather, uh, even uh, outside our presence and uh, hearing, to, to be in your headquarters or as you go to whatever conveyance uh, that takes you to your home within our great county, or if you're just um, in the halls eating or whatever, remember that it would be a violation for you to discuss this case amongst yourselves in ones and twos or hand handicap the testimony, review the testimony, or otherwise uh, give your thoughts or impressions um, about any witness that has testified thus far. Remember, you can only consider this case probably when the court gives you uh, at a time and place instructions on how to do that. You cannot consider it in any way 
um, until such time as uh, the court instructs you. Remember, it would also be a violation for you to add to your understanding, as I call it, meaning uh, <coughs> phone a friend, so get a resource um, book, uh, go to a uh, website, or any other source that to, to aid you in uh, anything that you've heard thus far in this courtroom. Remember, you can only consider what's been lawfully presented in the, within the four walls of this courtroom. You cannot consider any outside sources, people, or otherwise reference materials uh, to aid or augment your understanding. Um, the other thing you cannot do is to um, go by any scenes that you may have heard about or may have been testified to in this case. You've been shown a bunch of maps and other uh, audiovisual aids at this point in time. You are not to go by and visit any of those scenes. You're not to go by and take any pictures, do any sketches or anything like that, or share any other information you may know about those particular uh, sites that you may have knowledge of. Remember, you can only consider what's been lawfully presented within this courtroom, okay? All right. Also, ladies and gentlemen, if any third party or were to attempt to talk with you, reach out to you, email you, text you, or otherwise call you in any way to potentially reach out and communicate with you about this case, remember you to let myself and Sergeant Ingram know immediately. And then, ladies and gentlemen, the la and lastly is how we end uh, most of our admonition sessions. You know, we are really appreciative of the patience and attention that you've given to this particular matter, and we'll continue to give to it. And um, we don't we we state that to you, um, and we ask that you. Uh, uh, every day we tell you this, but um, but that is. Uh, the, on behalf of all the parties here, ladies and gentlemen, we really appreciate your patience and attention that you have given and will continue to give to this, to, to the consideration of this matter. All right, ladies and gentlemen, unless you have any other, um, inquiry of me, um, we will talk with you on Monday at 8.30 and, uh, for an anticipated nine o'clock start time. And then we'll see where the week leads us at that point in time. Okay. All right. Unless you have anything else, all rise. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, our jury has left us. Um, please be seated. <laughs> all right, anything else I need to take up with you all? Um, I'm going to recess in place to allow Mr. Melnick to finish talking with, uh, with Mr. Copeland and uh, find out uh, who is, if he or somebody else at his dad is going to be here on Monday. And, uh, but if not, we will be here on Monday at 8.30. Um, any other things I need to consider? Yes, Your Honor. There is a matter regarding the jail calls that we were provided. Mr. Steele has not yet provided us the ISO file. Um, we, again, we received something additional on a thumb drive last night. We had the head of our, the deputy of our jail call unit look at that. And we are again Unable. missing. We do not have the complete file to be able to play the to be able to access it properly, to be able to look at it, authenticate the calls, the time of day, all of that. We don't have it. Um, we were provided last night a thumb drive with with cut and pasted file names up under headings um, with um, some additional pieces of a file that would have had to, again, have been deconstructed from the way that the file would have been given to counsel for Defendant Williams. We are asking the court to compel defense counsel to turn over to the state the file in the condition, in the original condition that it was given to them so that we may properly access and evaluate the content and the time and date and all of that and the authenticity of those calls <laughs> on that file. It has been deconstructed and particular parts of the file have been extracted and purposefully kept out of what is given to the state. So we are asking again that the court compel either, you know what, and if they don't want to, then we're asking that they just be excluded. Okay. All right, Mr. Steele, do you have the raw file? Judge Glam, sir, you allow another moment when Miss Love calls me that I did not do something. They have the exact image of what we got from the jail in Fayette County. 
That is it. And if I get another false allegation and you do nothing, I'm shocked. I'm appalled at you. I sit here day after day with this false allegation just machine. I gave the state everything. There's not been no disconstruction. <clears throat> There's been no purposeful. I don't care. I don't care. I give over everything. I've done this for 33 years. Never in my life have I seen a trial. I've done 300 appeals in the state of Georgia alone. I've never read a case like this. Judge, I gave them everything I had. I waited. I was at my office till eight after eight last night. I waited for their investigator to come by. I handed him an exact copy of thumb drive. They have everything that we got from the Fayette County Jail. There's been no deconstruction. There's been no purposeful exclusion. This is not the first time. Okay. And I apologize that I'm getting tempered, but I've never been treated like this. You talk about professionalism every week. Professionalism is lacking with one lawyer here. It has never been. I, I don't even like coming to court. I used to love this. I would die for what we do. I used to say I'm dying. I, I would die. I couldn't choose a better profession. If I had litigated with Miss Love, I would. I would. Your Honor, could we strike no, the hominem I, attack? No, I'm really. Could we strike? I, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, everybody, calm down, calm down. Everybody, I mean, both false. of you, sit. Both of you, please be seated. Uh, judge, I'm not. Both done. of you, please be seated. You have to do something. You have threatened me with contempt. You have threatened me with jail. If you go back in time, we can just start in voir dire. Jury after jury, you did individual voir dire painfully. Miss Love would come in and say that juror was crying. It was not true. You would say, that's not my recollection after I said it. You did nothing. We start okay, the case. Mr. Steele. I asked you, please. Mr. Steele. Please, Mr. Steele. How would you feel if you were being treated Mr. like Mr. Steele. Mr. Steele. Oh, I'd like to finish. Mr. Steele. I gave him everything on that drive, and it's continual abuse of a prosecutor of another member of the bar. I don't talk with Miss Love, I, and that's fine. I like that. But, Judge, I'm not going to stand here anymore. I don't care. You can take my bar card. Mr. Steele, I'm not trying. I'm not. Uh, listen. Uh, it, wrong, there, though. There, but there. And Mr. Williams, you know, to me, this is an innocent man. You talk about Miss Love said. There's a man in the Fulton County Jail who shouldn't be there, Mr. Copeland. Mr. Williams shouldn't be in custody. <coughs> but he's been charged, and we come here for a fair trial. It's been everything but that, according to that Ms. Love has tried to demonize me. At times, Mr. Adams. At times, Mr. Shaw. Now, I object now to the and I ask All Mr. because she wants to Again, win the case. The and now she speaks over people. It's not right. I gave them everything. And by the way, and what I want to tell you, by the way, it's not even the law. If they call that gentleman on direct, I don't have to give them anything before trial. I do it because you asked me to. You said, listen, we got a big case. It's going to take a long time. Give them things. I gave this, by this way, to the state October of 2023. October 2023, that was uploaded, <laughs> given to the state. I hear about it now, and I okay. wait there, and I give them the exact duplicate of what we have, and now there's a false allegation of misconduct. Right, but, but, and what I'm telling the court is what I said again. I do not appreciate it, and you never. You have told it in front of the jury that I'm unprofessional. You were wrong. You based that on Miss Love's False representation. Your Honor, again, the ad hominem attacks, Your Honor. I, I object, am, and he should and stop talking when I object. Try right. to silence me. Your I don't, will not be silenced. <coughs> but Mr. Steele, here's the here's the thing. Okay, I think that I but, but, I Mr. Steele, please be please, please be quiet at this point in time. I, uh, you you made your point. You made your point at this point in time. Both of you, please be seated. Both, please be seated, and, sir. And we'll sir, please be seated. Whatever you do. It's fine, but I care about Jeffrey Williams. It's the best year. It's ob sir, it's obvious. He, I, I would expect no less because you're his advocate, you're his champion. But could you all please sit down so I can kind of figure out a solution for this? All right. First, let me let me just kind of address the obvious. I know that at time tempers have been heated in this particular trial and they continue to do so. And I know that all of you are being zealous advocates and representing your clients to, to the best of your ability with zeal and zeal and rigor. However, I would, I agree that, you know, there should not be ad hominem attacks on, on anybody or any counsel. 
and that you all should think and reflect about what you say about your brothers and sisters of the bar. Um, cause we have a, we have a large, large contingent of folks that watch this trial. And I mean, and so, and so not only for the purposes of this, but it just, it sends a, it sends not, not the message I think you want it to send. All right. So I'm going to leave you all to your wise discretion in order to do that. But, um, I'll take up whatever I need to take up as, as, as I see fit. But I know that you all, uh, this has been a long trial. It's been, it's very demanding, exacting and grating on and tiring, uh, on all of you. So I ask you to just take a couple of deep breaths and step back and see and kind of look at and just remember that you do represent of who you represent and what you're, what you're here for. Um, in terms of the the tape or the phone calls from Fayette County, it's the court's suggestion that, and if you want my assistance, I can always, with a proper subpoena, have the raw, whatever it is that you were, whatever you're seeking to get, I could get that, and you can compare that against what you have. Because maybe that's what, I mean, and Mr. Steele, I don't doubt and I know that you would you would never delete or otherwise try and alter evidence. And I, I assume that that's what you got. And, and I'm and I'm going to I'm going to take that at face value. I'm in no way saying that that saying that Miss Love uh, is um, in her. Her argument is saying that she is when it's stripped down, less all the sound and fury. It. She's saying that that particular type of file has other things with it. I don't think you were given those. And that's what she's trying to get. So I'm in no way blaming anybody in this particular circumstance. But if you want that particular file, and I think you all should have that particular the raw file, then let me let me do a, a notice to produce or or a rule nice eye, and maybe we can get the entirety of the file. And I think that if you did that, I think that the whole thing would probably be produced to you because nobody probably wants to come down here and see me. So I will work with you all to get that. Uh, and you all can, we can, we can, we can take it at, we can take that up. And, uh, it's a problem I think can be resolved, but I'm in no way, but I would just remind everybody to be careful about what they say to each other. Um, some things you just can't take back and remember, um, Y'all are going to see each other over and over and over again. And, um, you know, it, it, it serves, serves you and serves the profession, serves your clients. It, it's not effective. So just please consider what I've just told you. All right. So, um, I'm just going to recess and we'll see where Mr. Melnick is at that point in time. And then we'll, uh, I can, I can talk about Monday for certain. Okay. All right. Okay, we're going to be, I'm just going to recess in place. Collect your thoughts and please be seated. All right, um, Mr. Melnick, uh, welcome back. The time is uh, 2.20.35, I should say. <coughs> um, did you have an opportunity to talk with your client? I did. All right, uh, who is going to be here on Monday? Kayla Bumpus. Kayla Bumpus. B-U-M-P-U-S. Okay, all right. Um, then she... I can state as Mr. Copeland's attorney of record, Told him, are you sure this is what, asked him, are you sure you, this is what you want to do? And he said, yes, he intends to assert his Fifth Amendment privilege again on Monday. Okay, well, I'll, I will, I will, if you would tell Ms. Bumpus she needs to be here at 830, and we will certainly take up sit with that knowledge uh, um, before we call our jury, and I will ask him uh, in, in her presence uh, whether or not he intends to do that, and we'll see where we go from there. Okay. Okay. All right. Anything else? No. Okay. All right. Sir, um, enjoy your time off, okay? Thank you. All right.
Okay. Uh, Council, is there anything else I need to cover with you before we uh, before we recess uh, until Monday? Got it. Yes, Mr. B Mr. Botts. Mr. Botts, you need to use the microphone, sir. All right. <laughs> is it working now? Can you hear me fine? Yes, sir. All right. Your Honor, we started this whole fiasco out with whether the state knew that Mr. Copeland was going to take the Fifth Amendment when he took the stand. And if so, was that proper or improper to put him up on the stand knowing that they were going to... You have to speak up, sir. If you could hold the microphone, it would probably be better. That he was going to assert the fifth. And I know that they did know that he was going to take the fifth because I heard it said outside right before I walked into court. I even said... The officer. Then why didn't you, as an officer of the court, tell me before before we uh, before we took his testimony? I told Mr. Steele. No, 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 no. Why didn't you, as an officer of this court, tell me? Well, then that's my. I got a problem with you now. Well, that's fine. I mean, uh, I got a problem with you now. Well, I, I would have... suggest you don't say any more. I've already said. It. I know that, sir. And the problem is you should have told me if that were your case, then you've just made an argument that was that could we didn't even need to have because I could have certainly asked him based upon your proffer. Now you want to have it both ways. You can't do that. Your Honor, I thought the state knew that. And, I and that's not what the point is. The point is you as an advocate is you should have t you should have told me. Both sides have an equal responsibility under the rules of professional responsibility. Okay, as long as we're both responsible, that's fine. All right, have a seat, sir. Thank you. Uh, I have a request of the court. Is that okay? No. What's your request, sir? Um, so, in the attempt to avoid any spurious allegations moving forward, I would ask that your honor order that the deputies transport Mr. Copeland to the jail completely separate from any... Yeah, I was going to... Thank you for reminding me about that. In, in our order... Have... Wait, wait, just one second. In the order of the incarceration, I'm going to um, also have a keep separate order for him. Your Honor, for the transportation and the housing, because none of these gentlemen are going to say anything to him, but I don't even want anyone to claim that okay. he did. I think that that's fair enough, and that's a good suggestion. All right. We'll prepare. Yeah. Yes, Lieutenant Walker. Yes, I have a separate So that will not be an issue? Okay. Okay. Yeah. But, we'll, but we'll go ahead and have him. If you could also have him housed separately, too? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, madam. All right. Anything else? Councils? All right. Take a couple deep breaths this weekend. Take a knee. Um, and um, come back on Monday and let's... Uh, Let's get after it again, okay? All right, we'll see you on Monday morning at 8.30, okay? Can you um, get us the list of names and any exhibits for Monday? I think the only per I, I don't know who is being called. Uh, we can find out. Um, Ms. Love and Ms. Hilton and Mr. Atkins, uh, who is going to be called? Let's assume that Mr. Copeland invokes again. Yeah. Is, uh, mm -hmm. Do you have some other witnesses that we can we can take up at that point? Your Honor, um, we will apprise after we look at and reevaluate where we are because our order of proof was building blocks that at this point began with Mr. Copeland. And there are certain things that have to take place before we can tell them anything. So okay. we need Fair to enough. we have to do that. We have to deal with that and where we are right now. All right. And um, that's just where we are. OK, well, be thinking about the what scenarios you'd like to you'd like to have the court look at um yes, Your Honor. depending upon whether or not he uh, mr copeland decides he'd like to um invoke his privilege again okay yes sure right. and you're on go ahead now mr sharp may he can have four yes could, could i'm just going to ask a courtesy of the deputies could we just keep uh our clients here for just five minutes after court and 15 minutes after court ends, um, the attorneys would like to have a discussion with our clients. I'm Lieutenant Walker. <laughs> and, 
And Your Honor, the state has a matter we would like, we need to take up ex parte with the court. Okay. All right. Um, Lieutenant Walker has been asked by defense counsels um, as a corporeal body for them to be able to talk with their clients um, once you clear the courtroom. Yes. Can you make that happen? Yes. Okay. All right. So once everybody, once everybody is um, cleared the courtroom, um, you just secure it and let them be in here uh, alone with their clients. Okay. Okay. Oh yeah, we, we, once once we get once we go down. Okay, yeah. I'll make it Okay, thing. all right. Okay. Um, One last thing, Your Honor. Um, I just thought of this. Your Honor probably already thought of this. Um, the no contact order with Mr. Copeland should probably also include not just these gentlemen, but other gentlemen that are on this indictment that are not sitting for trial. I think that would probably. Be. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Um, okay, we'll see you Monday, okay? 8.30. We're in recess. <laughs>